the most successful in the automotive industry robots operating today in the hands of real people are ones that are traveling over 55 miles an hour and in unconstrained environments, which is Tesla vehicles, so Tesla autopilot. So I just, I would love to hear sort of your, just thoughts of uh, two things. So one, I don't know if you've gotten to see, you've heard about something called Smart Summon, where Tesla system, autopilot system, where the car drives zero occupancy, no driver in the parking lot, slowly sort of tries to navigate the parking lot to find itself to you. And there's some incredible amounts of videos and just hilarity that happens as it awkwardly tries to navigate this environment. But it's it's a beautiful nonverbal communication between machine and human that I think is a from it's like it's some of the work that you do in this kind of interesting human robot interaction space. So what are your thoughts in general about it? So I I do have that feature. Mm -hmm. um, do you drive a Tesla? I do. Oh, no. um, Mainly because I'm a gadget freak, right? right? So I, I say it's a, it's a gadget that happens to have some wheels. Yeah. And yeah, I've seen some of the videos. Um, but what's your experience like? I mean, you're, you're a human robot interaction roboticist. You're a legit sort of expert in the field. So what does it feel for a machine to come to you? It's one of these very fascinating things, but also I am hyper, hyper alert. Right, like I'm hyper alert. Like my yes. butt, my thumb is like, oh, okay, I'm I'm ready to take over. Yeah. Um, even when I'm in my car or I'm doing things like automated backing into, uh, so there's like a feature where you can do this automated backing into a parking space, um, or bring the car out of your garage, um, or even you know pseudo autopilot on the freeway. Yeah. Right, I am hypersensitive. I can feel like as I'm navigating, I'm like, yeah, that's an error right there. Like yeah. I am very aware of it, uh, but I'm also fascinated by it. And it does get better. Like it, I, I look and see it's learning from all of these people who are cutting it on. Yeah. Like every time it's I cut better, it on, it's but... getting better, right? And so I think that's what's amazing about it is so that. This nice dance of you're still hyper vigilant. So you're still not trusting it at all. Yeah. That's... And yet you're using it. What on the highway, if I were to like what as a roboticist, we'll talk about trust a little bit. I, what <laughs> how do you explain that? You still use it. Is it the gadget freak part? Like where you just enjoy exploring technology? Or is that the right actually balance between robotics and humans is where you use it but don't trust it? And somehow there's this dance that ultimately is a positive. Yeah. So I think I'm, I just don't necessarily trust technology, but I'm an early adopter, right? So wow. when it first comes out, I will use everything, but I will be very, very cautious of how I use it. Do you uh, read about it or do you explore it, but just try it? Do you do like uh, crudely, to put it crudely, do you read the manual or do you learn through exploration? I'm an explorer. If I have to read the manual, then at, you know I do design, yeah. then it's a bad it's user a interface. It's a failure. Elon Musk is very confident that you kind of take it from where it is now to full autonomy. So from this human robot interaction where you don't really trust and then you try and then you catch it when it fails to it's going to incrementally improve itself into full full where well, you don't need to uh, participate what's your sense of that trajectory is it feasible so the promise there is by the end of next year by the end of 2020 is the current promise what's your sense uh, about that journey that Tesla's on so there's kind of three three things going on, though. I think in terms of will people go, like as a user, as a adopter, will you trust going to that mm -hmm. point? I think so, right? Like there are some users, and it's because what happens is when, when you're hypersensitive at the beginning and then the technology tends to work, your um, apprehension sl slowly goes away. And as people, we tend to swing to the other extreme, right? Because it's like, oh, I was like hyper, hyper fearful or hypersensitive and it was awesome. And we just tend to swing. That's just human nature. 
And so you will have, I mean, and I- That's a I, scary notion because most people are now extremely untrusting of autopilot. They use it, but they don't trust it. And it's a scary notion that there's a certain point where you allow yourself to look at the smartphone for like 20 seconds. And then there'll be this phase shift yes. where it'll be like 20 seconds, 30 seconds, one minute, two minutes. It's a sc it's, scary it's, it's, proposition. But that's, but that's people, right? Yeah, that's humans. just, that's humans. Um, I mean, I think of even our use of, I mean, just everything on the internet, right? Like think about how reliant we are on certain apps and certain engines, right? 20 years ago, people have been like, oh yeah, that's stupid. Like that makes no sense. Like, of course that's false. Like now it's just like, Oh, of course, I've been using it. Yep. It's been correct all this time. Of course, aliens, I didn't think they existed, but now it says they do, <laughs> obviously. 100%, Earth is flat. <laughs> so, okay, but uh, you said three things. So one is the okay, human. Okay, so kind of one is the human, and I think there will be a group of individuals that will swing, right? Uh, I just- Teenagers. <laughs> Teen I mean, it'll be, teen it'll be adults. Um, there's actually an age demographic that's, optimal for technology adoption um, and you can actually find them and they're actually pretty easy to find uh, just based on their habits based on um, so if someone like me who wouldn't wasn't a roboticist would probably be the optimal kind of person right early adopter okay with technology very comfortable mm -hmm. and not hypersensitive right mm -hmm. um, I'm just hypersensitive because I designed this stuff yeah so there is a target demographic that will swing. The other one though, is you still have these humans that are on the road. That one is a harder, harder thing to do. Um, and as long as we have people that are on the same streets, that's gonna be the big issue. Um, and it's just because you can't possibly, I wanna say, you can't possibly map the, some of the silliness of human drivers, right? Like as an example, when you're next to that car that has that big sticker called student driver, mm -hmm. right? Like you are like, oh, either I'm going to like go around. Like we are, we know that that person is just going to make mistakes that make no sense, right? How do you map that information? Um, or if I'm in a car and I look over and I see, you know, two fairly young looking individuals and there's no student driver bumper and I see them chit chatting to each other. I'm like, oh, yep. that's an issue, right? So how do you get that kind of information and that experience into a, basically an autopilot? Yeah, and there's millions of cases like that where we, we take little hints to establish context. I mean, you said kind of beautifully poetic human things, but there's probably subtle things about the environment about is about it being maybe um, time for commuters to start re going home from work and therefore you can make some kind of judgment about the group behavior of pedestrians yes, blah 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 yes, and so on yes so on. or even cities right cities. like um if you're in boston how people cross the street like lights are not an issue versus other places where people will will actually wait yes. for the crosswalk. <laughs> Seattle or somewhere <laughs> peaceful. And, but uh, what, we all, what I've also seen, so just even in Boston, that intersection to intersection is different. So the, every intersection has a personality of its own. So that certain neighborhoods of Boston are different. So we kind of, uh, and based on different timing of day, at night, it's all, it's all, there's a, there's a, dynamic to human behavior that we kind of figure out ourselves we're not be able to we're not able to introspect and figure it out but somehow we our brain learns it we do and so you're you're, you're saying is there so that's the hard, a shortcut that's, that's, is there a shortcut though for robot is, is there something that could be done you think that you know that's what we humans do it's just like bird flight, right? That's the example they give for flight. Do you necessarily need to build a bird that flies or can you do an airplane? So is there a shortcut to well, it? So I think the, the shortcut is, and I kind of, uh, I talk about it as a fixed space um, where, so imagine that there's a neighborhood that's a new smart city or a new neighborhood that says, you know what? We are going to design this new city based on supporting self-driving cars and then doing things 
knowing that there's anomalies, knowing that people are like this, right? And designing it based on that assumption that like we're going to have this, uh, that would be an example of a shortcut. So you still have people, but you do very specific things to try to minimize the noise a little bit. Um, as an example. And the people themselves become accepting of the notion that there's autonomous cars, right? Right. Like they 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 move into, so right now you have like a, you, you will have a self-selection bias, right? right? Like individuals will move into this neighborhood knowing like this is part of like the real estate pitch, mm-hmm. right? Um, <laughs> and so I think that's a way to do a shortcut. One, it allows you to deploy. It allows you to collect then data with these variances and anomalies because people are still people, but it's um, it's a safer space and is more of an accepting space. I.e., when something in that space might happen because things do, because you already have the self selection, like people would be, I think, a little more forgiving than other places. And you said three things. Did we cover all of them? Uh, the third is legal law oh, no. liability, which I, I don't really want to touch, but it's still it's it's still of concern. And the mishmash with like with policy as well, sort of government, all all that that whole that big ball that of mess. Ball of stuff. Yeah, gotcha. So that's <laughs> so we're out of time now. Uh, <laughs> do you think, from a robotics perspective, you know, if you if you're kind of honest of what cars do, they they kind of we kind of threaten each other's life all the time so cars are very i mean in order to navigate intersections there's an assertiveness there's a risk taking and if you were to reduce it to an objective function there's a probability of murder in that function meaning you killing another human being and you're using that first of all you, it has to be low enough to be acceptable to you on an ethical level as an individual human being, but it has to be high enough for people to respect you, to not sort of take advantage of you completely and jaywalk in front of you and so on. So, I mean, I don't think there's a right answer here, but what's how do we solve that? How, how do we solve that from a robotics perspective when danger and human life is at stake? Yeah, as they say, cars don't kill people, people kill people. Kill people kill people. Um, <laughs> right. Um, so I think and now robotic algorithms would be killing people. right. So it will be uh, robotics algorithms that are pro. No, it will be robotic algorithms don't kill people. Developers of Develop- robotic algorithms oh, okay. kill people, right? I mean, so. one of the things is people are still in the loop, and at least in the near and mid term, I think people will still be in the loop at some point, even if it's a developer. Like we're not necessarily at the stage where you know robots are programming autonomous robots with different behaviors yeah. quite yet. Um, not- it's a scary notion, sorry to interrupt, that a developer is has some responsibility in, in, a, in the death of a human being. That's a I mean, I think that's burden. why the whole aspect of, of ethics in our community is so, so important, right? Like, because it's true. If, if, if you think about it, um, you can basically say, I'm not going to work on weaponized AI, right? Like people can say, that's not what I'm going to do. But yet you are programming algorithms that might be used in healthcare algorithms that might decide whether this person should get this medication or not. And they don't, and they die. Okay, so that is your responsibility, right? And if you're not conscious and aware that you do have that power when you're coding and, and things like that, I think that's, that's that's just not a good thing. Like we need to think about this responsibility as we program robots and and computing devices um, much more than we are. Yeah, so it's not an option to not think about ethics. I think it's a majority, I would say, of computer science. Sort of there, it's kind of a hot topic now. I think about bias and so on, but it's and we'll talk about it. But usually, it's kind of. You, it's like a very particular group of people that work on that. And then people who do like robotics are like, well, I don't have to think about that. You know, there's other smart people thinking about it. It seems that everybody has to think about it. It's not, you can't escape the ethics, whether it's bias or just every aspect of ethics that has to do with human beings. Everyone. Yeah. So think about, I'm going to age myself, but I remember uh, when we didn't have like testers, right? And so what did you do? As a developer, you had to test your own code, 
right? Like you had to go through all the cases and figure it out. And, you know, and then they realized that, you know, like we probably need to have testing because we're not getting all the things. And so from there, what happens is like most developers, they do, you know, a little bit of testing, but it's usually like, okay, did my compiler bug out? Let me look at the warnings. Okay, is that acceptable or not, right? Like that's how you typically think about as a developer and you'll just assume that it's going to go to another process and they're going to test it out. But I think we need to go back to those early days when, you know, you're a developer, you're developing, there should be like this, a, you know, okay, let me look at the ethical outcomes of this, because there isn't a second, like testing ethical testers, right? It's you. Mm -hmm. Um, We did it back in the early coding days. Um, I think that's where we are with respect to ethics. Like, let's go back to what was good practices, only because we were just developing the field. Yeah. And it's, uh, I mean, it's a really heavy burden. I've I've had to feel it recently in the last few months, but I think it's a it's a good one to feel. Like I've gotten a message more than one from people. You know, I've unfortunately gotten some attention recently, and I've gotten messages that say that I have blood in my hands because of working on semi autonomous vehicles. So the, the idea that you have semi autonomy means people would become would lose vigilance and so on. That's actually be humans, as we describe. And because of that, because of this idea that we're creating automation, there'll be people be hurt because of it. And I think that's a beautiful thing. I mean, it's you know, there's many nights where I wasn't able to sleep because of this notion. You know, you really do think about people that might die because of this technology. Of course, you can then start rationalizing and saying, well, you know what, 40,000 people die in the United States every year and we're trying to ultimately try to save lives. But the reality is your code you've written might kill somebody. And that's an important burden to carry with you as you design the code. I don't even think of it as a burden if we train this concept correctly from the beginning. And I use, and not to say that coding is like being a medical doctor, but think about it. Medical doctors, if they've been in situations where their patient didn't survive, right? Do they give up and go away? No. Every time they come in, they know that there might be a possibility that this patient might not survive. And so when they approach every decision, like that's in their back of their head. And so why isn't that we aren't teaching, and those are tools though, right? They are given some of the tools to address that so that they don't go crazy. But we don't give those tools so that it does feel like a burden versus something of, I have a great gift and I can do great, awesome good, but with it comes great responsibility. I mean, that's what we teach in terms of, if you think about the medical schools, right? Great gift, great responsibility. I think if we just change the messaging a little, Mm -hmm. great gift, being a developer, great responsibility and this is how you combine those but do you think i mean this is really interesting i it's it's outside i actually have no friends who are sort of surgeons or or doctors i mean what does it feel like to make a mistake in a surgery and somebody to die because of that like is that something you could be taught in medical school sort of how to be accepting of that risk so, because I do a lot of uh, work with healthcare robotics, uh, I I have not lost a patient. For example, um, the first one's always the hardest, right? But they really teach the value, right? So they teach responsibility, but they also teach the value. Like you're saving forty thousand, mm-hmm. but in order to really feel good about that, when you come to a decision you have to be able to say at the end, I did all that I could possibly do, right? Versus a, well, I just picked the first widget and did, right? Like, so every decision is actually thought through. It's not a habit, it's not a, let me just take the best algorithm that my friend gave me, right? It's a, is this it? Is this the best? Have I done my best to do good, right? And so- You're right, and uh, I think burden is the wrong word. If it's, uh, It's a gift but you have to treat it extremely seriously. Correct. 